We had an absolutely terrific kickoff to the Reinvent the University for the Whole Person series. In the first episode, I think we, we really accomplished three major tasks as a group that really sets us up for the whole rest of the series. The first thing that I think we accomplished that was so important, which was to start to develop collectively a robust definition of the kind of whole person that's demanded by the future. The pace of change is accelerating, and we study these accelerating paces of change. If you're doing today a master's degree in one of these fast-moving areas like biotech or neuroscience or advanced robotics, by the time you finish your master's degree uh, today, you're out of date in these fast-moving areas. And it really forces us to rethink how we think about uh, learning. We generally see us going from education systems to learning systems. We don't teach facts anymore to kids because they can pull it down from Wikipedia and Google. And we think actually learning goes down the same route where you pull it down as you need to for the task at hand, right? And then I think this is where the whole person approach comes in is what is the task at hand that you want to accomplish uh, as an individual? And I think that's um, undeniably true. I think we're moving into an era of great acceleration and rapid change. And what I would contribute to that too is I think it's an era of incredible collaboration. One of the things I'm constantly aware of is our need not only to prepare people for change, but the need to work with others, not just one type of others, but increasingly um, diverse groups of people. Students ought to be learning how to learn without having a, an institutional structure to, to guide them all the time. There's a huge concentration among the students that I teach at, at, uh, at Berkeley and, and now at Stanford on, on learning the subject matter. And um, as we've learned, the subject matter is going to, to change. And I think it is now essential. If the, the world you're going to enter after you leave an institution, the, the, the facts are going to change and you've spent your time orienting yourself towards the facts, you're going to be at, at a disadvantage University structures with professors and curriculum are really still uh, concentrating on, on feeding students and not so much on in, encouraging students to, to feed themselves and feed each other. Any good educational environment that's ever existed has taught people how to learn and how to think. I don't think that that is a, an artifact of modernity in any real sense. Um, I think that the probably the number of people for whom that kind of learning is necessary and vital in their sort of civic and particularly their economic participation has expanded tremendously and that and that is a, a truth of the times we live in. When I think about sending students out into the workforce and the kind of skills they need, at, you know most of our students can learn the kind of technology skills they need. What I, where I think they really struggle is what we're doing here, which is to get with people, technology, in person, whatever, and really learn to have a conversation and to build, to make, to do together. I think the second accomplishment of the first episode really had to do with starting to develop, you know, what we might call in architecture, the brief for the kind of university we need to, to reinvent. Um, what does that university have to look like? What should that university accomplish or do as its core practices if that's the kind of whole person that we want to create. Whereas we're seeing this dramatic flip to this the whole person approach and if it's the whole person then you have to consider the whole life and if you're doing that then the university as an institution needs to be a lifelong partner to the individual not forget when they enter as an undergraduate but after they finish most of our learning now takes place at the workplace, in the workforce, uh, uh, iterations through different jobs and careers is where we do our learning. And the university maybe needs to morph its, its kind of structure to adapt to being a partner for every individual as, it goes, as they or he or she goes along that journey. I think for undergraduates, again, the age range I am um, working on, where we should start is building small, collaborative communities of very diverse people and they would be given a problem to solve because I think where the knowledge production 
is important to learning is that you learn holistically when there's a big problem to solve with others. So I would do that. And the third thing I would add to that little mix in the first year or first six months is some kind of form of self-reflection. Mentoring, um, it can be online. I think people, in order to learn holistically, have to think about what they're learning, who they are. They have to learn the process of self-critique. Institutionally, I actually have a deeper connection than with Presidio to Esalen Institute. And I want to mention that as the one innovation that I would want to see if we were designing a university from the ground up today, uh, uh, building on Rebecca's point about self-reflection. That part of the kind of group dynamics tradition has, so far as I can tell, had very little impact on universities, even though it is starting to have quite an impact in, in the corporate world, in the business world. I think the experience of going to like a college or a university is can be sort of simultaneously isolating in two senses. Like people um, come inside these institutions and have little contact with people outside them, but they don't have much contact with people inside them either. And so I think on the one hand, you really do need authentic relationships like with people that you live with, wherever you are. The other part of it, and this is what I think is exciting about the world we live in now, um, and I'm actually very much an enthusiast about the role of information technology in this whole conversation is that there are going to be global communities of communities of learners um, emerging out of the uh, migration and transformation of all kinds of higher education into digital environments. I, I think that's just a fact about the future. So a third area that I think that we really accomplished, what is the whole person that's demanded? What's the brief of the university to teach that whole person? Is that we started to identify some of the tensions and became not anywhere close to resolving them, uh, some of the tensions involved in moving forward. And there I think one of the most fundamental questions that uh, emerged was, can the university reinvent itself? Can the university um, from the inside uh, create a new version of itself that is responsive to this massively transformational cultural moment? Let me be quite controversial here. Um, I've spent a lot of time restructuring organizations and something that I've noticed is that an existing status quo institution or organization cannot reinvent itself. And this concept of tenure or legacy siloed thinking around how our institutions are structured is so backward and so out of date compared to where we need the future to go that you have to essentially start from scratch. You have to start from a greenfield environment uh, and reinvent for the future, otherwise you take too much of the baggage from the past into it. From somebody who works for a $25 billion corporation called the University of California, uh, we're not about to go away. <laughs> there are many good things that universities provide uh, in terms of infrastructures, in terms of technology, in terms of smart faculty, providing education for large numbers of people. Uh, but there's been an enormous increase in administrative, a layer of administrative infrastructure. Uh, there, there are some, you know, reasonable reasons for that. Trying to move away from that kind of administrative layers and layers and layers of infrastructure, uh, I, I, I think is an important challenge. I would just want to put in a word for um, getting out of the way of people who are, are doing uh, innovation right now I'm a little suspicious of the, the sudden interest in um, some big universities in creating their uh, departments of uh, online entrepreneurship. I, I just think if they would just look around at the people who have been um, innovating and um, under the radar and encourage them, it's, it's already happening all over the place. So I'd like to speak for a moment about the role of alternative spaces in the existing institutions. I think what we're seeing in America is the emergence of these kind of creative spaces. I think of them as intellectual playgrounds, as places that faculty and students come and they work on very different kinds of solutions and very different kind of problems. And I don't want to say that there's a solution, but I think there is a kind of emerging movement going on so many faculty, I don't know, probably at Swarthmore, I would say nearly three quarters of our faculty are involved in one of these spaces or another, and almost all the students find their ways through them. 
So I think we're very much between the times. The 20th century bureaucratic structures, Max Weber was so right in what he predicted, predicted. and the 21st century, much more looser network spaces and institutes and centers. So how do we go forward um, and move the system forward, I think is an open question. Which of our structures get in our way? Which of our structures um, are enabling of developing an empowered learner or an empowered uh, citizenship? Which of our legacy traditions and assumptions are things that are the unique strengths of the university and which of our legacy assumptions are actually barring us from being able to imagine how we could reinvent ourselves. So those are the questions I think to carry forward through the rest of the series but overall with those three areas um, this first episode gave us a fantastic basis upon which to then explore in more depth what are the skills needed for the future? What are the environments we need for the future? How will we know if we're having impact? How do we shape policy around higher education? And then most importantly, what are the strategies for change?